Wonderful words of life. I don't know if the author had it in mind, but in John chapter 6, when Jesus spoke of himself as being the flesh that his followers must eat, it says from that time many of his followers went back and didn't walk with him anymore. And he asked his disciples, do you also want to go away? And it was Peter who said, to whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. And that's what we want to study about. Say it with me, Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Remember Hebrews 3 and verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Well, I want to start a, uh, a new little series with you. I maybe just uh, uh, a few studies, two or three maybe. And uh, since we talked about taking aim, now we're going to be looking at belief, um, <clears throat> facets of belief. You know, when they talk about precious uh, gemstones, uh, diamonds, for example, it, when they're cut to give them this, um, you know, beautiful uh, sparkle and everything, they have edges cut on them, and those are called facets, and that's what makes it sparkle. And um, we're kind of going to be looking at the facets of belief and faith, that which makes uh, faith so special. Uh, and, and these are things that the Bible brings out about faith. And when, when you think about faith, the opposite or the enemy of faith is doubt. And when we increase our faith, we get rid of doubt and vice versa. As doubts arise, faith diminishes. And so they, they are really uh, enemies of one another. And when, when, uh, if we really want a strong faith, we have got to constantly work on nourishing it, and that will in turn get rid of or, or put more and more pressure to get rid of doubts. Uh, the house that I used to live in, there was a, a ante an old antenna uh, po pole, and well, it wasn't just a pole. I don't know if you've seen these. They're like a, a triangle, like a three-sided tower uh, that would go up as high as the house, and then the the single pole would be on top of that for an antenna. For for all of you uh, under 30 years old, an antenna is how we used to watch TV. <clears throat> and, and so that, that uh, tower, that TV tower, obviously had nothing on it anymore. But I liked it because it was attached to the house and I could go up the, uh, up the tower and just step off onto the roof anytime I needed to do any work on the roof, gutters or whatever. Uh, I didn't have to get the ladder out. I just shinny up the, the uh, TV tower and step off on the roof. It was really great. But um, I decided, you know, there were some local TV stations not too far away, and I thought, I'd kind of like to go up there and, and install an antenna, and um, that was higher than the roof. I'd never been any higher than the roof. So I uh, thought I'd go up there and do some preliminary work and get it ready to accept a pole and an antenna. And so I, I go climbing up the, the, the tower, and I and I just no problem. I've done this hundreds of times, you know, or seems like hundreds of times. And, and I get to the roof like I've always done, and it's no problem. And 
the the top of the tower is probably another I don't know maybe ten feet above the roof, and I I grabbed onto the next rung, and I I froze up. I looked and it was far down to the ground and it it felt like it was kind of wobbly now. And I thought, wait a minute. And I went back down and, and, uh, I just, I couldn't do it. So I went back down to the ground and I got, you know, kind of got my bearings and I went back up and the exact same thing. I take one step past the roof and I just freeze up and I could feel myself actually shaking. And I thought, I don't know if I can do this. And I went to the garage and I got uh, some rope and I, I uh, put it through my belt loops and then I put it around the tower and I tied two or three big, good, solid knots. I thought, okay, you know, I'll, I'll just keep this on here. That'll give me some confidence as I go up. If I were to fall for some reason, you know, that rope would at least be around there and slow me down. Maybe I could grab on. Went back up. <laughs> stopped again could not make myself go any further you know the problem it was doubt i had doubts i didn't have faith in the in the 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 tower i didn't have faith in my strength and climbing ability i didn't have faith in the rope to stop me i i lacked faith and doubts arose and it kept me from going any higher Now, I spent way too long giving you an illustration, but I I just want you to understand the relationship between faith and doubt. And, you know, if you were going to study about faith, what's the first thing that pops in your mind? And for a lot of you and me, it's going to be Hebrews chapter 11, right? Because when we go over, the Hebrew writer starts chapter 11, he says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That is the primary definition of faith. Um, When we, that's our go-to verse when it comes to faith, isn't it? We look to Hebrews 11.1 1 to get a, a, a grasp on the concept of faith. And, and, and look at that again. I want you to have that firmly in your mind. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. There's a footnote there that says the realization of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The footnote is the confidence of things not seen. So faith is the realization of things hoped for. You know, things hoped for are always in the future, aren't they? You don't hope for what's in the past. You hope for what's in the future. What's in the future, you can't see and touch and smell and all of that. You can't, it's not tangible if it's in the future. But faith is the realization of that. Faith is what makes it real. And it's the evidence, it's the confidence of things that aren't seen. Like uh, our speaker this week, Chuck, talked about, uh, you know, if you get in an elevator and you hit the button, you start going up, and somebody asks you while you're in there, you know, uh, how does this thing go up? And you say, well, it's got this motor and there's these pulleys and there's these cables and, you know, the motor starts turning and it pulls the, the cables on the pulleys and it, and it makes us go up. And the guy says, how do you know that? I said, well, that, that's how elevators work. Have you ever seen the motor in this one? No. You ever seen the pulleys or the cables? No. How do you know they're there? Uh, I know I have faith that they're there because we're moving, and that's, and that's how elevators work. But I've never seen them. You know, I, they may tear that thing apart and find out it's made out of magnets and all of this stuff. And my faith was based, it was ill-based. It, it was wrong. But if I can base it on fact, like the Bible, then I don't have to see it with my eyes. And I, I, I'm running out of time quick, but I, I just I want to go over to 2 Corinthians, the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and the beginning of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I, I want to talk about some things that Paul says there <clears throat> regarding uh, faith. And he's been talking about 
you know, the, the things that, uh, that he's been through, the things that Jesus has been through. And then beginning in verse 16, he says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, that is a really intriguing paragraph. The more I read it, the more I'm intrigued by it. Um, everything that Paul saw and felt and heard, it was all, he says, temporary. It was not what was really real. It, they were surrounded by things that would eventually be no longer. And the language that's used here, it's just full of, uh, you know, like apparent contradictions, but they're not. It's full of, uh, of um, uses of speech that maybe we're not used to. It's, it's just really intriguing to me because it says, for example, uh, in verse 17, our light affliction is working a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. Now, could they see and feel and hear and experience what he's referring to as their light affliction? Oh, yeah. In fact, you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and start reading that, that list of things that Paul said that he had gone through that he could brag about if he needed to. Uh, you know, all of the afflictions that he endured— could he see them and feel them and hear them and, and experience them? Yes, and he did, but he refers to it as his light affliction, affliction, which is but for a moment. But it, he could see it. But he says all of that is working a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Could he see, hear, feel, experience at the present time that eternal weight of glory? Not yet. That wasn't tangible as far as physical senses. And so in verse 18, he says, we do not look at the things which you're seeing. How can you not look at the things which you're seeing? The only way is to turn your head, right? Well, in a manner of speaking, that's what he was doing. He was turning his head away from all the thing, the physical things that he was experiencing so that he wasn't looking at them. But now look at the second part of that. We do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. How do you look at something that can't be seen? Now, that, that's what intrigues me about this. You don't look at the things which are seen, and you do look at the things which are seen. You... Can you say to somebody, uh, look at that house behind the, that, uh, that, that stand of trees there. I, I can't look at it. All, all I can see is the trees. No, look at that house. Just look at it. I, I can't see it. Well, Jesus is telling us, look at your sins being forgiven. Look at your home in heaven. Look at the treasures that you have laid up in heaven. Look at eternal things and stop looking at riches and uh, status and lands and all of the, the, the lust of the flesh and the things that appeal to your Stop looking at those and look at heaven. Well, can, can we look at heaven with our eyes? No. Look at the treasures that you lay up in heaven. Can, can we feel that? Can we run our hands through it? No. And, and it's just such a neat concept that you, you stop looking at the things which you can actually see, and you start looking at the things that you can't see with your eyes, but he's going to go on to tell us 
that we can see those things in another way in, in chapter 5. And I guess I'll just have to wait till next time to talk to you about chapter 5. I, I knew I'd spend way too much time and not get where I wanted to go. But you'll come back and be with me next time, the Lord willing. Let's pray. Holy Father, we're grateful to you for the things that you've laid up for us that you have challenged us to see, not with our physical eyes, but through the eyes of faith. Help us increase our faith. Help us to believe in those things that that we cannot see with our physical eyes because you've given us evidences that we should believe. Father, help us today to increase our faith and help us to stop dwelling on the things of this world and be more and more longing for our home in heaven. Forgive our sins, Father, and hear our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, This is an exciting kind of thing for me because uh, it's really really what being a Christian is all about. It's to stop looking at here and start looking toward heaven from the moment you uh you come up from the waters of baptism paul says in colossians that you are to start seeking things above where christ is seated at the right hand of god stop looking around and start looking up that's that's really the big message of becoming a christian and it's it sounds simple but the practical doing of it is not easy because we're surrounded by things here that people, especially the devil, is encouraging us to look at. Well, I hope that these uh, things have maybe whet your appetite to uh, talk more about belief, that is faith. And uh, if you want to talk more about these things, just uh, leave your comment. If you're watching there on Facebook or YouTube, if you want to talk more at length or a little more privately, use my Email jdmundy3355 at gmail.com, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, correspond that way. Use your smartphone's camera app and, and aim it at that QR code, and you'll see our, the, the link to our website come up, stoneridgechurchofchrist.com. Go to the website. Take advantage of it. Look at the, read the articles. Watch the, uh, the, the Bible classes and the the weekly sermons and the gospel meetings and all of the things that are available there. We want you to take advantage of those things. They're there for us to use, but they're no good if we don't go and take advantage of them. Hey, we are right in the midst of, well, actually, we are finishing up (laughs) our gospel meeting. We just have tonight, and then it's done. And I'm telling you, it has been the most wonderful week with Chuck Bartlett. We're thankful that he came to be with us, and he's held nothing back. He has preached the gospel with all the zeal and the vigor that he can muster up, and he has done a masterful job. So tonight's message, victory is for those who, and he's going to fill in the rest of that. Come and be with us. We want you to be here. Um <clears throat> Thursday, which, uh, you know, we were looking at, I'm, I'm taping this a day ahead of time, is your baptism hindering you from being baptized? I want you to go back and listen to that, too, from last night. Uh, and and uh, please, you know, take advantage of all of these. Also, come and um, be with us in our regular meeting Sunday 10 a.m. for Bible class, 11 a.m. for worship, again at 6 p.m. for worship, Wednesdays at 7 p.m. for Bible study, and we always have uh, classes for every age group, so come no matter what age you are and be with us, the Stone Ridge Church of Christ. We're at 514 Airport Road in Jonesboro. Come and be with us. Hey, until next time, if the Lord spares our lives and gives us another opportunity to open the pages of his inspired word and study together, I hope that you have a great day. Remember, if you want to get rid of doubt, what you've got to do is increase your faith. And Paul says, Romans 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. 
Zaxby's new Philly. The garlic aioli, grilled peppers and onions with melty cheese.